Hello and welcome to the eShopper Barometer live event. Thank you for joining us from all over the world. We are coming to you live from the Geopo studio in Paris. My name is Benjamin Dier. I'm your host. And for the next 50 minutes, we're going to unveil the 2023 eShopper Barometer results. What are the key findings of this seventh edition? How do eShopper respond to the economic context? What are the latest trends? These are the questions that we will answer on this set with my guests, Carmen Cureux and Hervé Crochet. Hello and welcome. Hello. Good morning. Uh, great to have you, Carmen. You are Market Research Director at GeoPost. As an expert in market research, you manage strategic studies for the group, such as the eShopper Barometer, uh, brand awareness, white papers, or market share surveys. Uh, great to have you. Uh, Hervé, you're head of sales at GeoPost with a 20-year experience in the European CEP industry, both in marketing and commercial departments. You closely follow the e-commerce trends to feed GeoPost strategy and services portfolio, as well as develop win-win partnerships with global accounts. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, let me share with you a quick preview uh, of the topics we're going to discuss on this set. After presenting what the landscape of e-commerce looks like, uh, we will discuss the ever-growing impact of C2C platforms. We will also focus on how delivery is key to a positive e-shopping experience uh, and how the product is still at its heart. And we will wrap up by mentioning the growth of uh, social shopping and how to stay ahead when it comes to selling online. I have a lot of questions I want to ask you, but before we get started, let me tell you that you can contribute to this live event because all of you can share your questions to our speakers just by using the chat. So feel free to send in your questions at any moment and we will take a moment by the end of this program to answer your questions, uh, the ones you have shared with us during the live, so fire away. Uh, to start off this session, Carmen, uh, could you remind us what this survey is about? Yes, uh, more than glad to do so. Uh, so the eShopper Barometer, we have here the seventh edition. Uh, it's a survey that we make uh, on a yearly basis in 22 European countries. So uh, between May and July of last year, we interviewed around 24,000 eShoppers across uh, Europe. When I say e-shoppers, it's people who bought online and received at least a parcel in the six months prior to uh, the survey. It's not a study about us, Geopost, or about DPD. It's a study about uh, e-shoppers, their habits, their attitudes, and their expectations in the e-commerce space. We do not mention any brand whatsoever. So uh, let's go and see the results. Great, thank you for this introduction. Let's get going with our first chapter. So, Carmen, for this seventh edition, what does the landscape of e-commerce look like? Well, I think if I had to use just one word to qualify e-commerce in 2023, I would say resilient. Of course, uh, since the end of the COVID pandemic, we lost some e-shoppers. Uh, people went back to the physical stores. And I think this phenomenon was accentuated in 2023 because of the inflation and the tough economical conditions. So we lost uh, e-shoppers all across Europe. We now have 76% of Europeans who buy online, exactly the same figure as back in 2019. But among the shoppers who stayed in the e-commerce space, uh, there are some big changes in terms of behavior that are very positive. Um, I'm thinking here about the regular e-shoppers, those who buy on a monthly basis. We are still as high as in 2021, 2022. So we have an increased frequency of purchase among people who buy online. And also a proof of that is the fact that among those regular e-shoppers, 15% slightly more uh, of uh, whatever they buy in terms of physical goods are bought online, compared to less than 14% back in 2019. I already said 2023, a year with uh, rough economical conditions, of course, people started to make trade-offs and we saw that the number of parcels received on a monthly basis went a bit down, 5.2 uh, par parcels received in average on uh, one month, but still above 2019 levels. 
We'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, Hervé, how does that reflect from a business standpoint and can you share some trends on, on volumes? Yeah, actually, if we uh, look back in 2022, it was pretty hard to keep up with uh, COVID 2C volumes uh, because physical retail was, was coming back. People wanted to go uh, and buy, you know, in the stores. 2023 is, is different, has been uh, quite stable, I, I would say, because with the rise of inflation, people were going back, let's say, to online shopping to get some better deals, uh, actually. Um, and if we look also uh, across Europe, the situation is, is a bit different. Uh, and I believe because on average we have 14 to 15 percent of total retail, which is online, you have Eastern countries or Southern uh, European countries where uh, the maturity of online is not that uh, as high as on average. If I take the example of the UK, 27 to 30 percent of total retail is online. And I really believe that Eastern Europe or Southern Europe will have a further growth uh, uh, in the future in those areas. And 2023, let's say, was, uh, was pretty stable. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, overview, Carmen. If we look at the goods purchased online, what is the global picture you can share with us? Well, I would say uh, we still have e-shoppers who buy lots of categories. It's not just about one or two types of products. It's six almost in average at a European level. And we have some countries where e-shoppers go even for more than that. I'm thinking about Poland, for instance, 6.7 categories uh, bought uh, on, on average. When we look specifically at the categories that are bought, the top three remains exactly the same as in previous years fashion, shoes, beauty, and healthcare, exactly the same levels as in previous years. But some other categories lose a bit traction. And I'm thinking here about uh, home furniture, uh, high tech. Of course, these are durable goods. You don't purchase them on a yearly basis. Uh, and also, it's high-priced goods. So in terms of uh, economical turmoil, people put them on the side. Another category where we do also see uh, trade-offs is fresh food. We lost a bit uh, in terms of penetration of this category, uh, three points lost compared to last year. Uh, we know that people who buy fresh food online go for organic products or gourmet products. And of course, again, highly priced. So uh, first to uh, go out from the basket uh, in terms of trade-offs. Uh, thank you, Hervé. With, with so many categories being bought online, can you elaborate on the strategies uh, e-tailers come up with to attract and retain customers? Yes, uh, w what we can see is that uh, you have a specialist in some categories uh, which sell their, their own products <coughs> that they, 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 they resell. And what we've seen is that uh, some of them are really expanding to new categories. I have some examples, like in the fashion, uh, uh, let's say, websites, which have uh, increased the product categories to uh, toys for the kids, or also even um, to the electronics, or even more. So they're attracting more uh, e-shoppers on, on that platform. And in addition, also, we've seen an increase of marketplaces where those uh, e-retailers could enable uh, other sellers to sell on their website through the marketplace uh, part. So meaning that consumers would find in one place more choices. So that would attract and enable consumers to buy in one place more than one product categories. Great. Uh, so we've seen that e-commerce is still solid, still going strong, but obviously the economic context and inflation are a big challenge. Uh, what is the impact you can see on e-shoppers' behavior? Well, basically, tighter budgets shape our behaviors overall as consumers, um, and e-commerce is not a, an exception. Um, we do see that for almost two-thirds of regular uh, e-shoppers, price is the main criteria in terms of purchase uh, decisions. So quite, quite a high level. But this comes also with the good news. Uh, basically, we know that one of the reasons why people uh, buy uh, on, online is that they think it gives them, uh, it opens them uh, doors to saving money. So very good deals. And this perception around e-commerce has just increased uh, in, in recent times. So I think this is one of the key things that ensures the resilience of e-commerce because people uh, use it as a way to access good, good deals. And when I think about ways of saving money when purchasing online, I think secondhand is part of the game. What a coincidence, because this <laughs> is our next topic. Let's talk about C2C. So 
So C2C um, has really become very, very popular all across Europe. Uh, it used to be, let's say, much more popular in France than in other countries. Now uh, it's touching all countries. We have basically 72% of uh, European regular e-shoppers either buying or selling on C2C platforms. In terms of frequency of purchase, we have 12 uh, purchases per year, one per month. And thinking back about what I said at the beginning, five purchases per month, one of those five purchases is now made on C2C platforms. These are quite impressive figures for sure. Uh, are some countries more active than others when it comes to C2C platforms? Actually, yes, uh, that's what we find in the, in the study, in the results. And I will make a, a focus on two countries. Um, if we take Poland, you see uh, with 14 times a, a year, which is the highest we, we can see in, in the survey. Uh, actually, the, the background is the fact that with the high inflation, when we made the survey in the first semester 2023, inflation was at 15%. And really, C2C platform enable uh, consumers to really have uh, some gain in terms of purchasing power uh, because they can buy uh, at good deals, but also potentially to resell and get some more money, let's say, in, in a way. If I take the background of France, very, very different. Looking at inflation, it was 5% uh, during the first semester 2023 compared to 15% in, uh, in Poland. But what's uh, very structural in France is that flea market is really part of the culture in France. If you come in France and you, you come in cities on Saturdays or Sundays, you will see many uh, flea uh, markets. And the C2C platforms, or let's say the digital version of, of the flea market. And also the platforms which really uh, set up C2C platforms enable to lift away some of the frictions like the payment, the security and transport services. So that explains why France also uh, has 13.7 uh, yeah, uh, times uh, some purchases per, per year in, in France. But you have other countries, uh, as you can see, the UK, Germany. So it's really, I would say, a global movement into Europe. Thank you very much for these uh, introductory figures on C2C. I I believe that you have also prepared a small quiz uh, to separate legend from reality when it comes to C2C. So one of you is going to make a statement and the other one will try to guess if it's real or if it is an internet legend. Let's go. Carmen, what I think is that um, mostly women uh, buy online. Am I right? Online, yes, for sure. Uh, if we look at C2C platforms, uh, we know that 56% uh, of uh, people buying on C2C platforms are women. So yes, more than men. But uh, if I look uh, at a broader picture, the profile of regular e-shoppers, we still find 56% of them being women. So yes, a bit more women, but not more than within the e-commerce space overall. Let me try again <laughs> then. Um, I think on C2C platform, people are quite young. Am I right? On this one, yes, uh, Hervé, you are fully right. Uh, we have a younger population uh, purchasing on C2C platforms. We have much more uh, 18 to 29 year olds and we have a bit less of 50 year olds and plus. Basically, it's not us, it's our kids who go on these, uh, these platforms. But um, I must say also that the shopper barometer is open uh, for answers to people aged 18 and more. I'm sure that if we had opened to 15 and plus, uh, the average would be even uh, lower than what it is. Let me try another guess. Now on product categories, um, I would say fashion is the most bought product categories on C2C platform. That was an easy one. And yes, Hervé, you are right. Fashion is the most bought category on C2C platforms, but also because it's the most bought category within e-commerce overall. Uh, it's not the only one. However, we do have toys that are uh, bought more by C2C uh, users than by uh, regular e-shoppers. I see you coming. It's women buying toys for their kids. Would yes. Of course. Uh, we also have other categories that are a bit more balanced in terms of, uh, let's say, gender. We have sports shoes, uh, sportswear, and uh, a more masculine category than feminine, I think. Uh, video games and DVDs also largely bought on C2C platforms. Now, Hervé, because you asked me three questions in a row, I have one for you, an easy one. Why do you think people go on C2C platforms? Yeah, that's pretty easy. I think price is a key criteria. 
Yes, but you know, I'm a market researcher, so I will expect more from you than just one answer. Right, let me think again. Um, I would say sustainability is certainly important for C2C platform. Let's see. So I guess, uh, Hervé, again, you are right. Uh, of course, saving money is uh, the best uh, option uh, that uh, people mention when uh, they talk about their experiences on, on C2C platforms. But also, uh, they mention the fact that uh, it helps them support a more responsible economy and it helps them support small retailers and private individuals who sell on these platforms. Great, thank you for sharing those facts and figures. Uh, to get a different perspective on C2C e-shopping, let's turn to expert and guest uh, speaker from afar, Nicolo Giacobino. Nicolo is in charge of logistics partnerships at Vinted. Let's hear what he has to say on that topic. Vinted is the leading C2C marketplace uh, for second-hand fashion in Europe. Fashion remain one of the main category and our expertise. Over the last uh, 15 years, uh, uh, since 2008, uh, when actually Vinted was founded, only women uh, was one of the categories. Uh, nowadays, uh, also men, for example, we noted that it's taking space uh, and now represent around 10% of the overall listing. Kids, uh, one of the most important one, uh, over one third uh, of the overall listing, while still women is uh, representing, let's say, uh, one of the biggest with 50% uh, of the listing. No real or significant change that we can uh, attribute to the, to the changing of the financial situation. Uh, what we know is that Winter is a, is a great place uh, for people to mitigate uh, the impact on inflation and also to support their own uh, financials. And this is valid both from uh, sellers and from buyers. Uh, from buyer because, for example, they can uh, find an item uh, like cheaper versus what they have spent if um, it would be a new item or a new purchase uh, while seller because actually they can sell and make some profit out of something that maybe was just laying at home and yeah. And they also can give a second chance and a second life to this item. So very interesting uh, to hear how uh, vintage buyer profiles have evolved over time and to note that uh, female e-shopper who started out uh, with Vinted still remain the main category. Uh, since we talk about the people who shop using Vinted, uh, how do their profile vary from one country to the next? Let's find out with Nicolo. We definitely see some, uh, some local specifics uh, from country to country, but we also see in general trends. Uh, over the last year, what is clear is that second hand uh, is becoming more relevant uh, and has significantly increased. Uh, in the past, uh, it was mainly associated to uh, thrift store or to, to garage sales, uh, while now, for example, accordingly to our climate change impact report uh, that was published this year, we have visibility on the fact that uh, one user out of five uh, would purchase uh, or would go for a second hand item versus a new one, even if the two prices are matching or are equal. And also we notice that uh, environmental and social uh, concerns are becoming one of the main drivers uh, of uh, buying second hand. Um, on top of that, um, the report also gives visibility on the fact that uh, buying second hand is better for the environment uh, versus purchasing a new item and that uh, overall, uh, uh, by, with buying second-hand, there is actually a reduction in, in emission of uh, 1.8 kilogram in CO2. And uh, yeah, and as well, the fact that I believe is quite important is that uh, one third of the users, so one user out of three, uh, with buying second-hand is, ac is actually preventing to, to buy a new item. A great insight and we'll get back to Nicolo a bit later on another topic. Uh, just a reminder that you can ask your questions to my guest on the set, to Carmen and Hervé, by using the chat. So feel free to do so uh, as we speak and we'll take a moment at the end of the program to answer the question you have shared with us. 
Uh, back to you, Carmen and Hervé. Let's return to basics now and open up a new chapter in this live event, uh, putting the product at the heart of the experience. So I want to ask you, can you share your key findings when it comes to the positive and negative perceptions customers feel when buying online? I think some of you were with us already last year, and I'm sure you will remember that we pinpointed last <coughs> year a decrease in the perception of e-shoppers of easiness of purchasing online. To put it simple, Benjamin, uh, we had more and more e-shoppers thinking that purchasing online was becoming difficult. Uh, and a good news this year, that kind of uh, perception stopped, so we are now stable. 71% of e-shoppers think it's still easy to purchase online, but we are still very low compared to the levels that we used to have uh, pre-COVID. Of course, we wondered why, uh, because uh, on top of price, convenience is the other key driver of uh, e-commerce. So if uh, the experience becomes difficult, it does not go well with convenience. And the thing that we discovered is that people mention much more the product nowadays compared to the previous years when they talk about their online experience. Two examples. When we think about uh, what prevents people from buying on a specific website, they say products out of stock, and they say it more than what they did in previous years. On the other hand, when we think about what makes people purchase from a specific website, so the drivers of purchase, they mention much more than in previous years the detailed description of the product, so very much oriented on, on the product. So it's all about making an effort for people to shop online. Could you explain what qualifies as an effort to an e-shopper? Uh, it's the question I ask myself, and because I don't want to come with just my own ideas, we ask the question to e-shoppers themselves. Uh, basically, what they said is that um, when they do not find the item online, that is an issue. So when the out item is out of stock, it's a big problem. I think nowadays people do not come online to buy a pair of sneakers uh, size 38. They come to buy a specific brand of sneakers, a specific model uh, with a specific color size 38. And when it's out of stock, it's a big issue. They have two possibilities change the website on which they purchase. And we know from last year, changing the website, changing your habits is always uh, laborious. Uh, or they can stick on the website on which they are and try to find something else. But finding something else is like being, you know, on this uh, highway or somewhere in the wild, driving with no GPS. Turn la left, turn right, continue straight on. It's a big issue. Therefore, a big, big importance for tools that will help e-shoppers make the right decision. Why would you say is it so crucial for e-shoppers to uh, choose a product accurately? Because if the product that they get uh, is not the right color, the right size, the right shape, they will return it. And return for e-shoppers comes with two problems, I mean, in their minds. Uh, we are talking here about perceptions. First of all, um, we know that in the past years, uh, e-tailers made lots of effort on reducing the number of ret returns because it's the less, let's say, uh, sustainable part of e-commerce, or at least it was pinpointed uh, as such. And these efforts had an impact. We see it in the figures of the shopper barometer for the first time in seven years, returns did not increase because they come at a cost to uh, the consumer. And second, when you need to make a return, it's not easy. We have a much higher share of e-shoppers thinking that returns are complicated. 45% of them think it's complicated uh, compared to uh, the overall shopping experience. You mentioned how e-tailers try to make returns even more uh, easier for all the e-shoppers out there. Why is it still so complicated from an e-shopper's perspective to return a parcel? Uh, it's, it's very personal. First of all, uh, e-shoppers say, I did not get the product that I wanted. 
I cannot use it immediately, so this creates a frustration. And when you are <laughs> frustrated, you are in a negative uh, mindset, uh, which tends to have a magnifier effect on everything else. So every single step of the way in terms of processes with returns will be more complicated. Um, E-shoppers give us, however, hints to the things that we could improve carriers and e-tailers to make returns easier. First of all, the packaging. The, the, the box is almost always gone when you realize that you need to return the product. So you need to invent or find your own packaging. You need to print a label and e-shoppers do not like to do that. And of course, you need to drop off the parcel somewhere. And if you need to carry it somewhere far away from your work or from your home, then it comes with an issue. Therefore, a big importance for a density of networks where e-shoppers can drop off their parcels. Thank you, Carmen. You mentioned uh, initiatives taken by e-tailers. Uh, Hervé, do you have some examples you could share with us? Yeah, and recently there were um, quite a lot of uh, initiatives uh, to reduce all those returns. Um, I would see two aspects. One is on the financial side, and uh, we could see e-retailers uh, asking a contribution by the shopper for the, uh, on the cost of the returns if they did not reach a certain uh, basket value, or if the uh, e-shopper is not part of the loyalty program, or even for e-retailers which have stores, physical stores, they would uh, provide only free returns if uh, the return item is into the store and not uh, elsewhere. So that's the first aspect. Second aspect, what you mentioned also, uh, product details, something very, very important. Uh, because it's true that when you buy online, you don't touch and feel uh, what, what you're buying, uh, buying or see it. So we've seen quite some initiatives where uh, you see on the websites, uh, for instance, if there is a model um, wearing a garment, you see the size of the model. So you better see what is uh, size M, how does it fit with uh, someone with such uh, age, for, for, for instance. Also, if you buy some shoes, going back to, to the shoes, um, if you buy a, a shoe from a brand which you do not know um, in advance, let's say, um, the website will ask you, if you buy such brand, what is your size? And then they will recommend the proper size for this uh, other uh, shoe brand, for instance. Also, you have some more sophisticated, let's say, um, um, uh, uh, um, ways of detailing the products. Uh, you could also have uh, augmented reality. If you have this table, for instance, a good example, you could see with an app in your living room, does it fit and where you would put it? Is it large enough, high enough, and so on? So really kind of uh, really helping you better understand how that would fit into your, your living room. Um, also, you have um, uh, some more also um, uh, initiatives which are um, uh, much more virtual, let's say, try on. You take a few pictures of yourself, so you have your kind of avatar, so you could see how a garment would fit in on, on you. So yes, a lot of initiatives to reduce uh, those returns. Thank you for sharing those examples. Uh, we're going to move on to another topic now and discuss, discuss another major trend, which is social shopping. Uh, social platforms come across as a, a powerful way to uh, showcase products, to engage with consumers, and to uh, and they become a complementary channel for retailers. Uh, Carmes, to, to get started, can you, what can you tell us about it? Well, we know that Europeans in general are quite fond of social media and uh, European e-shoppers also use a lot social media. 70% of them uh, use social media for purchasing purposes. But I must say in Europe, it's still very much focused on getting inspiration for the purchase or recommendations, either looking for recommendations or leaving recommendations after the purchase. So still very focused on pre and post purchase uh, phases rather than buying directly from social media. Still, we are getting there. We have 48% uh, of uh, European e-shoppers using social me media who buy directly, uh, specifically when they stumble uh, upon things in their uh, feed stories. These are interesting figures about Europe. Uh, what about someplace else? Uh, Hervé, I believe you were in China just last week. Uh, what data and figures did you bring back with you concerning social shopping? Yeah, in China, um, really uh, online shopping is day to day. If you, you think that 50% of the total retail <coughs> is online, 
really people buy, you know, every day. And social media over there is the most striking, striking figure I, I could see is very, very much used. So you can see uh, the figure that 97% of his shoppers use social media for uh, at least one shopping course. But the most striking, uh, I would say, figure is 88% um, do shop directly from social media. And I really think that in Europe, yes, it will uh, come even more mature o over time because it seems to be uh, so successful in China. I don't see why that would not come, uh, come um, in, in Europe. Thank you very much for sharing these. Uh, since we are talking about uh, social shopping, let's deep dive some more with our in-house expert. Christopher, welcome to the set, your social media lead at Geopost. Thank you for being with us. Uh, how would you define the status quo of e-shopping on social media? Good question. And as Carmen was saying earlier on, we do have a lot of Europeans who are active on social media. But as it stands today, I would describe e-commerce and social media more as a static storefront where... Um, e-shoppers can discover content or, we, for example, on marketplaces such as Facebook Marketplace, Pinterest with clickable posts where they're redirected to purchase the product online. There's real no, I would say, human interaction or authentic relationship that's developed. There's another side, even though there are many points, is um, influencers. So very often we can see product placement with influencers who have you know, millions of followers, hundreds and thousands of followers. But once again, it's a, a review on a product uh, or a product placement that we see during the video of another product. That's where it is today. How? would you say can brands benefit from uh, social media to enhance their traditional e-shopping strategy? Well, that also is an excellent question, Benjamin. And before I tackle it, I really want to share with everybody some fantastic news. I don't know if, you, if you've heard. This morning, uh, the numbers from 2023, worldwide usage of social media came out, and it works out that 5 billion people are actively using social media across the world. That's more than 62% of the world population. And also when we compare the growth of social media use per 2022, actually social media usage is growing more quickly than the population is across the world. So if we think about that in the, I would say the, the, the so e-commerce e and where brands should be, it's not enough for brands to be present on social media. Today, br brands need to be really active on social media, creating contact, mastering the tools, understanding the codes, and leveraging these to, to, to sell online. So there are quite a few examples. We can look at two. I spoke earlier about influencers, these large influencers. But there are another whole side of influencers that nobody ever thinks about that brands don't consider are nano-influencers. So these are people who are passionate about products um, that we can, for example, find on YouTube and who have maybe 500 to 10,000 followers. It's not enormous. But they have really long-term looks at products where they discuss them multiple times, many videos, and above all, when their audience asks them questions, they respond to them and they'll personalize the content they share. So this is one way brands can actually create a, a more interactive, authentic relationship with uh, th their customers. Another side where social media can really support uh, brands is through proactive customer support. Now, this is really something cool that's coming up. Normally, customer support deals with problems that have come in. Proactive customer support is when the, pro, uh, the customer support teams use social media, uh, listening, actually, to identify conversations online and to intervene in these conversations and say, hey, I discovered you've purchased our product. Seems like you're having a few issues. Can we set maybe up a live session and go through the steps together? So what does this proactive action do? The, the customer feels valued. The customer feels unique. And the brand is creating, yet again, uh, an authentic relationship. Do you think social media will become the new shopping Eldorado in the future? Well, yes, of course I do. And with the numbers we have and the way things are moving, and as Hervé spoke about Asian countries, yes, it's, it's developing very, very much. Um, what, what's really important here, I think, once again, there are lots of examples. Let's just look at two. There's generative AI. This is a buzzword that's come out. It's, an, it's a nascent technology. It's really cool. And if we think about it in the e-shopper space on social media, and we take the example that Carmen 
brought up earlier on about that pair of size 38 tennis shoes that weren't the right color and the person just sort of left passively and didn't go on shopping. Well, if we think how social media could integrate generative AI for the e-shopper to discover a product online, a generic product, that they could maybe fit to 38 Point five, okay, because this person has an intermediate size foot. Um, maybe have yellow uh, shoestrings added on, and maybe the name of their daughter or son, I don't know, put on the front. All in all, we're talking about uh, a tailor-made product that meets the needs of uh, an e-shopper, and then, of course, that would be made and delivered. So once again, we're, we're creating a, a more personalized, valued contact with our e-shoppers and also giving them exactly what, what they want and allowing them to take over the e-shopping experience. Um, the next one is, is, and maybe the final one, is hyper-personalization. And I think I, I'll give a, a you know, a, a example in my life about this is when, when I signed up for Netflix a few th years ago, um, and I, I, I love uh, vampire uh, st for stories, films, books, whatever. Anyhow, I turned it on. I looked for a, a, a film that I'd watched in the 1990s. Great. Fall on it. Found it. Discovered it. Okay. Watched it. It was great. Came back three days later, turned on Netflix, and then suddenly all these videos, series of, you know, vampire films are there. And I'm saying, my God, this is perfect. Netflix is the place for me. You know, we, 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 we like the same things. So naive, I know. But this is hyper-personalized content that makes the consumer feel important and at home. So if we take, once again, the concept of, uh, of social media and the algorithms that exist today, when these algorithms are further strengthened by AI and machine learning, we'll discover that they'll be able to feed e-shoppers, you know, the viewers online, with really tailored content that makes them feel important, uh, where they find exactly what they want, subtly integrating ads that aren't you know, just falling in your timeline. So, yeah, I really think hyper-personalization hyper is, you know, that it's, it's right around the corner. It's going to be fantastic with that technology. Great. Thank you for sharing those stories. I have to ask, Christopher, what is the one vampire movie you have to recommend for us? Well, listen, uh, the one I looked for, which is great, I really liked it, it comes from 1994, an interview with a vampire. Anne Rice wrote the book, and it has Tom Cruise and Bad uh, uh, Pitt, sorry, starring. All right. So, so we yeah, don't definitely watch it. I think there's even a, a newer version that's come out this year or last year. Well, thank you for sharing your passion. Thank you for joining us, Christopher. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move to our next segment now and discuss the main trains of delivery. So back to you, Carmen. Uh, I'd like to know what would you define as the perfect delivery? Easy question, easy answer. Uh, the perfect delivery is the delivery that happens when you want, where you want. Now, the difficult part comes in because where and when differs from country to country, from e-shopper to e-shopper, and even for the same e-shopper in different moments of uh, their lives. Um, to make a long story short, I think we have two scenarios. Uh, we have the home delivery uh, that must come with added value services on it. First of all, uh, real-time information you want to know where your parcel is. You've chosen the sneakers, right uh, brand, right model, right size. You want to know where they are. Uh, and this is the first expectation in terms of delivery options from uh, e-shoppers. Second, if it's a home delivery, you want to have a kind of a visibility on when it will happen. You want at least to know the delivery slot, if not to select it yourself, because then it will fit in your busy uh, day. If you have changes in your life, in your agenda, which happens, you want to be able to also planify again the delivery. And this specific item is going up in terms of importance for e-shoppers, or at least that's what we see in the shopper barometer. Second scenario, you are on the go, you are always away from home, so you want to have an out-of-home delivery. Of course, this comes with real-time information. You still want to know where your sneakers are, but then uh, we also have some other expectations, namely next day delivery. This is a prerequisite and it's already there for home deliveries all across Europe. Uh, it's still not there uh, for uh, out of home deliveries. So uh, an increase in terms of expectations from e-shoppers on that one. So two scenarios, home deliveries, out of home deliveries. Which one is the preferred one according to you? 
Oh, my favorite answer, it all depends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it all depends because there is no such thing as one size fits all in the e-commerce space. So delivery also uh, has the same, uh, the same thing. Uh, and I think the, the best proof for that is the fact that 51% of e-shoppers use more than one delivery place. And when we look at those more than one, uh, we still have uh, home deliveries coming first. 76% of European e-shoppers prefer to be delivered at home, but the proportion is slightly going down to the benefit of out-of-home solutions, parcel shops and parcel lockers that increase in terms of preference. Uh, what about uh, delivery preferences throughout Europe? Well, I said two scenarios, and I think I was wrong because it's probably more correct to say 22 scenarios All because right. we have 22 countries on the list. You know that year after year we bring this slide to you, although it's quite, quite heavy <laughs> and difficult to read, but some people within Geopost love it. I've grown fond of it uh, because it really shows uh, the diversity of uh, European preferences. You have three preferences per country highlighted in red, and you see that the combinations possible are so many. Uh, we still have Germans and English people who want to be delivered in a safe place. You still have Portuguese e-shoppers who prefer to be delivered at work. But the thing that unites us uh, in Europe is this dynamism that we see for parcel shops and parcel lockers in Western, Eastern European uh, countries at the same uh, level. Overall, how is delivery perceived according to the survey? Uh, I'm glad to say it's perceived much better than the returns. <laughs> we have 72% uh, uh, of uh, regular e-shoppers who think that delivery uh, is easy, so good. Uh, still improvable, but uh, already a good level. Um, and the interesting thing is that uh, with all the experiences we had in terms of del delivery over the past years, uh, as e-shoppers, we got accustomed to uh, the process and that forged preferences. In our world, uh, this is expressed not by positive preference, but by exclusion. And now e-shoppers know exactly the brands they or the carriers that they do not want to be delivered by, therefore 71% of them uh, think it's really important to know who will deliver the parcel at checkout stage. Great, well you just mentioned how key delivery is to e-shoppers. Let's hear some more about it with Nicolo from Vinted. Logistics is really important uh, and it's uh, one of the core of, uh, of Vinted. Uh, uh, going through the report uh, that I just mentioned before, we, we noticed that uh, it is impacting positively also the environment, uh, how through, through packaging. In fact, uh, a lot of users uh, are utilizing uh, packaging that, was, that were initially uh, meant to be used uh, for a single time, but actually can be recycled and used like for a second time, for example, on Vinted. And the fact that uh, around 73% of our users uh, prefer the item to be delivered to a pickup uh, drop-off point, uh, Pudo, instead of on delivery. And uh, a single delivery to Pudo versus to home is uh, reducing the impact of 62% uh, of um, CO2. Thank you very much to uh, Nicolo from Vinted for sharing his insights with us. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to uh, go to the questions you've shared with us uh, through the chat uh, and answer them here on set with Hervé and uh, Carmen. But for now, let's turn to our final chapter and see how to stay ahead. So, Hervé, uh, a simple question. Uh, how do you onboard, onboard all the trends we've discussed so far? Yeah, knowing those trends is very important. Uh, and thank you very much, Carmen, for all those details and, and insights and the evolution of, of time. And for us, it's very important to stay ahead. And for this, we have three main pillars. Um, so we have the first one, which is a, a common sustainability roadmap that we have across our entire group. And for this, we have not only the ambition, but we have a plan to be net zero by 2040. 
And our plan was validated by an external uh, body entity, which is the SBTI, so Science-Based Target Initiative. And part of this program is to deliver low emission deliveries in 350 cities across Europe. And this would cover around 100 million inhabitants in Europe. Um, also, we want to support and help uh, the shippers, uh, which are our, our clients, and we have set up uh, and created a carbon calculator so we can provide our clients with the level of um, carbon emissions uh, that uh, we do uh, transport for, for them, and also work together with them to uh, decrease and diminish and which are the means by where and when we can uh, lower those emissions. The second pillar is technology. You mentioned the fact that uh, all the user experience is very critical, very fundamental. And for us, being in direct contact with the uh, recipient uh, is something important. We had developed 10 years ago uh, a service called Predix, so by email and SMS, we were providing them with some uh, you know, uh, features so that they could be in the driving seat, so to be able to deliver to another day, another place, safe place. We went away forward with uh, now the MyDPD app, which was launched, and we have over 20 million uh, subscribers and users of this app. So we don't even have only embedded these predict features, but also we um, are, let's say, uh, asking more information that, um, for instance, uh, to avoid the delivery at school runs, meaning when people are going to get their kids at school, they don't want to be delivered at that time because they won't be at home. So they can input this information into my DPD app and we won't deliver at that time. So we will increase and improve the delivery satisfaction and the first delivery uh, attempt ratio. Um, and also, with all this data uh, from the, the consumers, recipients, the idea for us is to yeah, enhance and delight those uh, consumers into the deliveries, into adapting, fine-tuning our delivery service. And the last point is uh, choice and convenience. I mean, you talk about it when uh, actually you ask about the, what is the perfect, uh, let's say, uh, delivery solution. And I want really to focus on, on choice and convenience. And here, not on speed, but much more on the place. Uh, and we do provide uh, different choices, whether it's to home, whether it's to parcel shops, parcel lockers. And to add to this for the uh, convenience, what's very important uh, on the uh, out of home is the uh, density, the density of your network. And today, we have over 100,000 uh, parcel shops and parcel lockers across Europe. Um, and we won't start at the, uh, stop at this level. We will even grow this, uh, this density of network. And especially also look where there are some parts in Europe where we need to, to increase the density uh, so that our clients also can sell even more and to propose this type of out of home solution. And the last point also on choice and convenience um, is that we know that now the business is even more European or worldwide. So, in Europe, the idea for us is not only to provide those out-of-home delivery services domestically, but also cross-border. We have already opened a lot of cross-border lanes for enabling uh, to-shop delivery, but also shop-to-shop -shop deliveries, and there will be even more. Thank you very much, Hervé. Thank you very much for sharing all those information. We are right on time, so great job. Uh, this presentation is now coming to an end. We are going to uh, move on to the questions you have shared with us. Uh, starting with the first one, so uh, I'll let each of you uh, pick the question if you want. How do you perceive the e-commerce dynamic in 2024? I think the situation, I mean, uh, may I answer? Of course. Oh. <laughs> I think the, the, the situation uh, will improve in, in 2024. As I mentioned, um, I think that the overall share of online retail in the total uh, retail will grow over time. Um, and so that's why I think that uh, in 2024, with the fact that inflation is uh, getting a bit lower, people will get, let's say, uh, more purchasing power, because what we see also, because of inflation last year, uh, a lot of uh, companies and, and, and people were asking for higher salaries. So I think purchasing power will be uh, better, and people will go also online, because also to save, uh, let's say, on, on some money. Uh, and also because not all countries are at the same level of uh, on online uh, percentage in total retail. So there will be, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, a lot of uh, like eastern countries or southern countries which will be uh, growing even faster. So I think that retail, physical retail will grow higher than, uh, than, than last year. And online retail will also increase uh, um, and potentially I think maybe twice as much as the standard uh, retail. But still, 
we won't have, uh, let's say, the level of growth we had pre-COVID, where it was much more like 10%. Globally in Europe, we won't go back at, at this level um, yet. Thank you, Avi, for your answer, and thanks for this first question. Uh, moving on to the next one. Uh, hello, how do you think DPD Group is ready to respond to the need of seamless delivery when it comes to deliveries from Monday to, th to Sunday? Thank you. Actually, uh, if we talk about deliveries from Monday to Sundays, um, it's already existing in some, in some countries. Uh, the first one was in the UK. Uh, we do deliver from Monday to, to Sundays, so there's possibility. Uh, also France, we have these capabilities. After there are some, uh, let's say, uh, constraints in terms of uh, labor law or those kind of things. So it's not that, uh, it's not an unwillingness, but also uh, the capabilities and how we can do this uh, with complying with uh, local regulations. So there is some intent, but we need also to comply with the rules and also, uh, let's say, have uh, some exchange also uh, with our uh, subcontractors or employees because this is a change also in mindset. Great. Uh, our next question, uh, we mentioned sustainability earlier on, talking about C2C platforms. Uh, does sustainability still matter to consumers, according to you, according to the survey? I'll jump on that one, uh, Hervé, if you don't mind. <coughs> uh, yes, definitely. Uh, and you, you mentioned it, uh, Benjamin, uh, we talked about this when we talked about CTC. When we see the uptake of uh, secondhand purchases, clearly uh, sustainability matters. But also when we think about sustainable delivery, um, top of my mind, uh, one figure, uh, six out of 10, if I'm not mistaken, e-shoppers think it's important for them to have uh, also uh, let's say, uh, delivery options that are respectful of the environment. So yes, definitely still part of the game. Great. Uh, let's move on to our next uh, question. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, you said that e-shoppers buy 12 times a year on C2C platforms. What is the figure for the selling frequency? Ah, yes, uh, good question. Um, People sell, I mean, the frequency for selling is higher than for buying. Uh, I think it's, it's quite obvious. Um, we have an estimate. Uh, I think we are somewhere around 15 times per year in terms of sell, uh, sales compared to 12 for, yeah, for per, uh, purchasing. Thank you for sharing uh, that uh, figure with us. Uh, we're going to move to a uh, next question. Uh, C2C, we mentioned it, it's growing. Uh, do you provide, provide any specific services to C2C platforms? Actually, yes. Uh, it's really part of our strategy when uh, we re embark into the out of home deliveries. Um, really, the parcel shop parcel lockers are part of the type of delivery services really suitable for C2C uh, platforms, with uh, especially the shop to shop service, but also shop to home. Because as you mentioned earlier, uh, not all the, the, the countries have consumers which really favor all the time uh, the to shop, let's say, deliveries. So sh to shop is important for the first mile, last mile, but also mixed with uh, to home deliveries. Great. Uh, we have time for one final question. We mentioned those two scenarios of delivery with you, Carmen. Uh, the question is, do you have the profile of the out-of-home users? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, there is no such thing as user of just out-of-home. You know, we, we mentioned that uh, most people use several delivery places, but those who also use out-of-home, um, they tend to be, uh, let's say, uh, as young as the average uh, e-shopper, so no, not necessarily an age difference on that one. Um, we used to think in the, in the past that, uh, you know, some categories, uh, for some categories, people would not go for out of home specifically for the highly priced ones, high tech. But actually we see that those who get their parcels in uh, parcel lockers or parcel shops buy all types of categories. So high tech can also be delivered uh, out of home. And interestingly, in terms of frequency of purchase, they are quite, quite heavy users, those who use uh, very often the out of home uh, options. So uh, a very interesting uh, population to target, hence our uh, efforts of uh, development on our out of home network. Thank you for your answer. I do have one final question for you, Carmen. Uh, of course, we've learned a lot about e-shoppers today together. Uh, I, I heard that you will soon release a B2B barometer. Can you tell us about it? 
Yes, more than happy to do so. Uh, we've been looking for like seven years now at e-shoppers, private individuals who receive parcels. We know that they are not the only ones to receive parcels. We deliver to companies as well. So uh, we thought it would be important to look at how companies look at the supply chain, how they source, uh, and also see what are their expectations around delivery, how this builds into their daily businesses, not necessarily lives, but businesses, and also to see what is the impact of our own lives as e-shoppers on our behaviors uh, as pro uh, persons within companies. That's a great teasing. Can't wait. Thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Carmen. Uh, it's time to wrap up our presentation and this live event. A few words to uh, thank the communication department at Geopost for putting this event together. A big thank you to all our technical crew who made it happen. Of course, thank you to our speakers, Nicolo, Christopher, and to you, uh, Hervé and Carmen. It was a pleasure having you on the set. Thank you for watching and getting your questions. It was great to have you with us. Stay safe and see you soon with GeoPost.